And there we go. The, uh, the, the thing just notified that we are live and, uh, we are live on Friday for me, Friday afternoon. And I'm just going to take a second here and give the video here a share and, um, let everybody know what we're doing. So give me just a second as we do that. Uh, and then uh, as you're tuning in on this uh, Friday afternoon, Friday morning for you, maybe Friday evening, depending on where you're tuning in from, um, why don't let me, you let me know where you're tuning in from. So give me just a sec as I share this uh, video feed to a couple different places, letting people know that we've gone live. And give me just a second here. Share. And um, let's see. There we go. Okay, there we go. We are live on Friday afternoon and we are starting a new series. Well, we'll see what happens. Starting a new series. Um, uh, potentially, that's the that's the idea. Uh, starting a new series today that we'll do weekly. We might, for the first few weeks, jump around a little bit in terms of time that we start. Um, but we're starting a new series. So for those of you that are just tuning in, my name is Joshua Hoffert. I run a ministry called Wind Ministries. And um, we our, our goal, our heart, our intention uh, is to help people live a life connected with the heart of God. And so we do that in all kinds of different forms, uh, and we've done that in different ways in the past, presently. Um, we've been doing this for the last, um, uh, in different forms, anyway, not with wind, but in different forms for the last 15 or so years, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that now at this point. So we're getting, um, what do they say, long in the tooth. So uh, so again, what, what we do, our goal, our intention is to help people connect with the heart of God. And uh, whether that's through um, unpacking and understanding daily rhythms, whether that's through personal coaching and mentorship, whether that's through training people to hear the voice of God, understanding dreams and visions, uh, whether that's through offering inner healing prayer, um, yeah, we just just any kind of form that there's there's the various different forms that we try and present to people, and so you may know our dream interpretation shows that we've had maybe you've connected with some of the podcasting we've done with our good friend murray duick where we talk through what it looks like to move to move through uh the journey of the heart in our podcast voices from the desert the desert being the heart and so i've been thinking about starting this new series um uh, that we're calling the spiritual living series and uh, i've been thinking about doing this probably for the last well, we're in April now, so started around the beginning of the year, um, starting a new series, uh, talking, really working through what it means to be human, what it means to quote unquote, you know, this is a confusing term that conjures all kinds of thought processes is what it means to be spiritual. And so let's, like, I thought, well, let's work through that. And, and it started with the idea that we would talk about spiritual disciplines, um, imp implementing rhythms in our lives. And, and, and that's something that we'll for sure we'll talk about. Um, you know, we're, we're told often in the context of Christian discipleship, Christian growth, um, we're told often that we should fast right? We should pray. We should, great to see Amber on and um, well, we wonderful. Bobby jumps on, love Bobby. Uh, he's been following the podcast with Murray for a long time. Um, and Murray and I have been doing the podcast for more than a year now. So that's wonderful. Um, but we, we're told within the context of our, um, our church engagement that we should be praying, that we should be fasting, um, that we should be implementing these kind of routines that would help to deepen our life, but we're never really told why. And uh, we're just told that they're good things that we should do. So what 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 are ways that we practice that? What are ways that we engage with that? What are things that are, how does that impact us? Um, and, and, and really the way that my brain works, so, you know, I, someone could tell me to do this and it might be a good idea, but I want to know why. 
want to just unpack the principles behind it. And so starting kind of the genesis of this was starting with that thought was helping people understand engaging um, what it means to quote unquote be spiritual and and some of the the you know the the misunderstandings of that particular phrase where they derive from and and how we think about that you know you know sometimes when in in the context i had growing up that when we were talking about someone that was spiritual it meant someone either that could operate in some kind of great gift maybe they were deeply prophetic uh, maybe they had certain strange experiences seem to happen to them often, uh, whether dreams, visions, these strange events that they would they would um, talk about. So the so kind of we would we would communicate that someone was more spiritual because of the things that happened to them or the gift per chance that they carried uh, or that they they walked in. And you know those are those aren't necessarily bad metrics uh, to think about someone's gift or the kind of experiences someone has, but but you know the 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 conversation about becoming spiritual and it's a thing that uh, is um, uh, really has permeated the culture is you know you have people that identify as not Christian but spiritual you know you're spiritual not religious and so we have more and more spiritual people more and more spiritual sounding language. Um, we have various different um, sub movements within movements uh, that have splintered off in all kinds of different contexts, you know. And and so so, what does it mean to be spiritual? And and then what does it mean to be spiritual as a Christian in the world that we live in in contemporary society? And and so we we're starting this series, and we're going to go weekly. We're going to talk through some of these issues. We're going to talk through what it means to be a spiritual being, what it means to be a human being, and and specifically because you guys know if you're following um, what we do for any length of time, we're going to be looking at what the fathers had to say about this. We're going to look at some of the ancient wisdom that the church has to present. We're going to look at the Bible. We're going to pull up our scripture. But we want to see this through a lens that's not been infiltrated by a current paradigm of Western thinking, but but we want to look at, a, with a fresh lens, how did the earliest Christians see themselves engaging the spiritual vocation in a modern day world? And so what we're going to do is kind of work through what, what might be a a worldview or a lens that we can see our vocation, our sense of humanity and human being in um, human being in scripture. Um, and then from there, we'll kind of move through and, and we're going to bring various different quotes from early church fathers in patristic theology and, and try and think through some of these things. And then Lord willing and time willing, um, that, that one of the things I would love to do in the context of a series like this is, um, talk through each, a, and this is really what I want to do actually, but I just want to get there as well is talk through each age of Christian mysticism, uh, the Christian mystics, maybe you've heard them called the Christian mystics. Um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit, the, talk through the Christian mystics. What, how do we define each age of the quote unquote mystics? What defines a mystic? Uh, um, because I think sometimes, again, when we talk about being spiritual and we talk about, oh, the mystics, they were mystics because they had strange experiences, because they had dreams, because they had visions, and which which that particular definition would be complete anathema to many of the mystics. Um, so especially looking at some of the heavy hitters like John of the Cross would would really, he would be really offended by that. I think, you know, trying to speak on behalf of John of the Cross, but but looking through each age when it comes to great to see Ingrid, um, looking looking through each age of church history and what kind of constituted the 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 teaching and the and the movement that that um, uh, you know the, well not the movement but the teaching that constituted what it means to be a spiritual person, what it means to structure your life in such a way or live your life in such a way that um, you're constantly reaching towards the Father or living your life in a way that is oriented towards the Father. From looking at uh, the lives, the life of a man like Francis of Assisi to looking at the life of someone like Anthony the Great, you know, separated by a gulf of almost a thousand years, in what ways were they similar and what ways were they different and what kind of lessons can we glean from their lives? 
And, and so how do we separate those out? What are the distinctives of each age and what does, what kind of constitutes the rough scheme of when Anthony taught about the spiritual life, what did he, what did he think? What did he talk about? How did he live his life? And then how did he teach people to live their lives? And how can we gain wisdom and understanding in terms of our contemporary age and implement, implement, maybe assimilate, if you will, some of the things that we've seen other great men and women of God teach, walk through, and develop? And how does that impact us today? So so that's kind of the, the vision for the Spiritual Living series, is what does it mean to be human? Flowing from that, what does it mean to be spiritual? Are those things to be spirit? Does being spiritual mean to be less human and more spiritual? And how do we understand that? And so we're, we want to lay that out from a biblical and then a patristic lens. Patristic being how the early fathers thought through these things. So we get a fresh take on this that's not so inundated by our materialistic, consumeristic uh, society and 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 the way that the world today has impacted us. And for instance, one like one of the things we're going to do today is look at Genesis. And um, one of the one of the the primary things that gets us really twisted when we look through the Genesis narrative, Gen the creation narrative, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, specifically Genesis 1, um, which is a great place to start for what does it mean to be human in God's creation is to look at, well, where did it all begin? Um, the 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 misunderstanding of the nature of genesis right we we because because christianity was fighting for um uh, a claim on truth in the light of the scientific age post enlightenment working through uh, all of that kind of stuff you know um uh, the 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 creation story in genesis was taken and and filtered into a neo-scientific lens to try and prove that the way that the creation story is presented in Genesis 1 lines up with all of our, um, uh, all of our uh, scientific discoveries in the last 200 years. And, um, you know, and I've read, you know, I've read and, and watched a lot about this uh, over the years, you know, like just looking at um, uh, different theories. And I mean, I've, I've you know, younger theories, older theories in terms of is the earth 6,000 years old? Is it six, 16 billion years old? Um, and, and how do we, how do we say that in context of being Christian, looking at Genesis one and creation? And, um, and so I remember watching how you could break down with the layers of sediment and and fossil layers and the looking at the flood and the and the um you know the 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 story of Genesis 1 through 8 and the cataclysm of the flood and how that could have created a false fossil record that makes it appear to people who are not of faith that the earth's billions of years old versus thousands of years old and and so there's all these theories right and what do you what are we supposed to believe right it's like we, we've taken and what, but ultimately, what we've done is we've taken a narrative in scripture in Genesis one that's about creation and filtered it through a 21st century lens and said, What does this teach us about the scientific method? And the simple answer to that question is nothing. The, the, the Genesis one teaches us nothing about the scientific method, and that's something that is we, we, you know, I've, I, one of my, um, uh, a podcast I love listening to. And I've gone back and forth with, and uh, unfortunately, they've yeah, they've retired the podcast. But it was Ask NT Write Anything. There's a great podcast, uh, great podcast by the unbelievable uh, guys. If you look up that on any of your podcasting platforms, fantastic episodes. Uh, getting NT Write to just talk off the cuff about various different um, uh, topics is wonderful. Um, but I remember a question was asked by a pastor who was a fundamentalist pastor who had lost his faith because he couldn't square the uh, the the Genesis claims the claims of Genesis veracity based on fundamentalist claims that this teaches us exactly how the Earth was made um, and in a scientific way and he couldn't see it that way anymore and he'd actually lost his faith and was struggling because of it and it's so sad. 
that we've given people such a rigid system of seeing scripture, the world, and creation through that if any any hole is poked in the claim, the whole house of cards comes falling down. Rather than being able to engage with the text and try and understand what is this text teaching me about myself, about God, about life, about creation, about the universe. But instead, we've got a house of cards that's been propped up by certain things that have been handed to us that we're not allowed to question. And if we question them, then we're immediately um, considered heterodox or heretical. And and only in the lens of 21st century Christians are we, because if you think back 2,000 years, the early church fathers were not interpreting Genesis 1 through a scientific how does, what does this teach us about, or how does this, how does this square away and how can we fit this within the paradigm of the 21st century? The early church fathers aren't thinking that they're thinking, what does this teach us about what happened to creation? And what does this teach us about who we are as humans and what our vocation is? So, and that's part of the problem with Genesis one, um, is we, we read it less for its instruction about less for its instruction in the time that it was written. What did it mean to the people that wrote it and that read it? And we read it as, what is this? How do we argue the truth of this versus people that don't believe it? And, and that it's just, that's just a very sad thing for, um, uh, yeah, Tammy, that's right. A good timing for this is I've been struggling with distraction, how to live in this busy moving society, being able to be still and know in the middle of it. Absolutely. And and I'm hoping that we're we're going to be addressing those things. And so again, going right back to the beginning, how do we think of ourselves in light of creation? So when we when we take Genesis, rip it right out of its context, don't even think about the people who wrote it and the people who it was written for, and we go, well, this squares with the scientific method because of A, B, C, D, and E. Let's filter it there. Well, okay. One, let's let's take Genesis one for what it is, and let's go. What does this? What is this? What did this? Who wrote this for one? Genesis one. What did they mean when they wrote it? What, is, what was their intention? Who were they writing it to? And like some, like I don't. I remember growing up. I never even thought like this. I was never taught to think like this. Um, and thankfully, I have um, discovered better resources and better teachers. And not to demean the teachers I had when I was growing up, they were great. It's just, we just weren't taught to think this way. Genesis, the whole book of Genesis, who wrote it? And specifically one, two, and three, the creation story. Who wrote it? Who were they writing it to? And what were they trying to convey in the context of what they were writing? Those are important questions. Um, same kind of questions we have to ask when we read the rest of scripture as well. And when we read the gospels and everything, of course, we have to read that or ask those questions as well. And um See, unfortunately, we are we're faced with a world today that has so devalued human life um, and devalued the importance of the the human vocation and who we are as humans and what our call is and what our purpose is that you know we're we're essentially um, pulpy f- mass of flesh sitting on a spinning rock with. Uh, with no hope or no uh, nothing outside of ourselves that's even worth looking into or hoping for or anticipating, and that's kind of the 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 view that we get. It's it's in a way it's uh, apocalyptic about humanity, and um, yeah, Brooke will probably like this whole series. That's right. So it's great to see uh, Tammy jumping on as well, and and it would be great to see Brooke jumping on as well. So we love Brooke out here and. We're all the way on the other side of the country from you. So um, if you could take a second, by the way, and share the video feed, let people know that we're live. We'll be going live once a week talking through these issues. What does it mean to be spiritual beings or human beings? What does it mean to live as a Christian in the modern world? And the first thing we're going to do in this episode is going back to the book of Genesis. So right off the bat, we have to question our, our modern presuppositions about the book of Genesis. Uh, and the way that we read the book of Genesis and the way that we try and fit it within a, uh, a materialistic scientific uh, uh, worldview and, and then go, okay, well, Moses, most likely Moses wrote Genesis one, two, and three. Moses also, by the way, didn't exist at 
the moment of creation. So whatever happens, he's shown something. However that happens, God does God bring him back? Who knows? Doesn't it describe? He just says this is how it was. So um, so we have to investigate this, right? When we look at when we look at Moses, but we we uh, or when we look at Genesis, what one of the things that we have to think through in our modern world is that um, the 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 status of a human has been so degraded. And it used to be that we thought of human humanity as the the uh, um, the height of what it meant to exist. And now we look at humanity. I remember uh, a a while back I was looking at the uh, watching the movie for any of you that watched this, the movie Passengers, which with um, Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence, it was an entertaining movie, just a kind of a popcorn sci-fi flick that if we had time and this was about movie reviews, I would talk about all the ways that you could have made that movie better, but we're not talking about that. So the movie Passengers, for anybody that watched that movie, um, in the movie, uh, Earth has been overrun. They're sending a spaceship out to uh, populate another planet. And this is kind of the expansion of the human beings into all of the universe. Um, so it does, the plot's not important, but I was reading about it because I was just determining whether or not I wanted to watch the movie. And I read a review where the reviewer said this, I have the, I wrote the quote down because I was so fascinated by the, the way that humanity is, was viewed through the lens of this reviewer. And, um, and I'm not a movie, re movie review person, so I don't even know who this person was. I just wrote the quote down because I thought it was interesting. And the reviewer said this, the film is based on the Starship Avalon, which is transporting 5,000 humans or colonists and 258 crew members to a planet called Homestead 2. Sigh. Humans have found a way to infest other planets than Earth 2. I thought, what a fascinating fatalistic view of humanity. Humanity is no longer the, the, um, the catalyst for bringing advancement and beauty into the world. Humanity is the infestation in creation. According to, according to that worldview, which I think permeates most people today on some level, the world would be better off without humans being present. And, and I mean, we, we get that in, in every, um, you know, the, the, the argument for environmental consciousness, um, and the humans are, re are destroying the world. And I'm not saying that there may not be a truth to that, but we've lost sight of what it means to be human in our modern age. We've totally lost what it means to bring beauty and love and creation into this world. We've, we're looked at as the infestation on the planet and God forbid we figure out how to go to other planets and ruin them too. That's how people think about, uh, about uh, humanity. And, and, and this is, see this, and this is actually, it's not, if you were to compare that kind of thought process, the, the, the desecration of humanity, the, um, the infestation that humanity is on the world. Um, and you were to line that up with, with ancient world ways of interpreting human beings. Just think about the, the kind of disdain the Greeks and the Romans looked at the, 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 in, in terms of the religious pantheon of gods in, um, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Now we're talking, that's a little bit later, but, um, they were, they so didn't care about humans at all. Humans were just an afterthought. I mean, the character of Zeus as a, as an ancient God really was just like the only reason that humans were even important is so that he could procreate with them. Like he just used them for his pleasure. That was it. Humans weren't, are, were not in terms of, in terms of ancient religions, humans weren't important. They were the subsidiary of gods. They were subject to gods. They were, there was nothing special about human beings in, in ancient creation myths. And, and so we have, we, so that, this is not that dissimilar to where we, what we see in terms of a modern view of humanity. We're ruining the planet. We're ruining creation. We're going to kill everything. And, uh, humans are the problem. And there's even, you know, this is becoming increasingly popular uh, to, and I'm not, I don't know, this isn't a political talk, but 
the idea of depopulation, these kind of things have cropped into the, um, um, the public lexicon, right? You know, when I say depopulation, you know what that means, because that's a thing that people have talked about. Um, and, uh, uh, so anyway, the, the, the status of a human being has been so degraded and it's actually not that dissimilar to, um, the ancient mythos. Now that's where the Bible stands in contrast to every other creation, um, story. And that's, what's fascinating about the book of Genesis. And, um, the, 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 the first thing that we see, and I've got my trusty Holy Bible here, it's actually the first, when I really engaged a life with Jesus, the first Bible I was given and uh, my dad gave it to me. Some of you know who my dad is because you've been following what we do for a while. We've actually got some cool things planned, um, between my father and I too. So Genesis one, you guys are all familiar with the story, right? In the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And we see creation. God brings his Spirit to bear over all of creation, forms the earth, forms the sun, the moon, and the stars, forms the animals, forms all these different things, right? Um, and and so when we get to there's – there's a number of different points I want to make about this, but when we get to the creation – first, when we get to the creation of um, – of human beings in the person of Adam, Adam at the end of Genesis, uh, you've got, you have this, this phrase that is uttered after each stage of creation, where it says something to the effect that God saw that was good. God said that it was good. God knew that it was good. Something to that effect, right? He creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. He sees that it's good. He creates the animals. He sees that it's good. And uh, and then he creates Adam and Eve. Adam, well, we just say humans, but Adam and Eve, the particular creation of Adam and Eve aren't laid out until Genesis 2. But he creates humanity and he sees, and it, and it says, and he takes a step back, you know, proverbially, and looks at creation and say, and declares that his creation is very good. And and so if we're so that's that's one, so one thing to note is that. Creation's not very good until humans are placed in it. Now, this in context of, of our modern age and how our modern age views, views humans as the infestation of the planet, and we're destroying everything. Um, and so, so one is that uh, might as well be that humans don't exist. And, and then in relation to ancient, um, ancient religious paradigms, that human beings were just an afterthought of the gods. Here you have in Genesis a stark contrast between other creation myths and the story of creation the Bible presents. Actually, God created humans, placed them on the earth, and said, now the earth is very good. And so this is radically different. So right away, there's something distinct about human beings. Now, what we get in the story of, of Genesis, what we see is not a chaotic force bringing destructive power into creation as we would see in other mythos. What we see in the Genesis narrative is a good, loving, ordered creation being instituted by the creator and then calling it good and then putting his image in that creation. And so right, right off the bat, that says there's something different about this story than every other story that had come before. What Moses is writing in the context of Genesis 1, he's not, this is the thing, Moses isn't trying to tell you the scientific way that creation happened. Moses is trying to tell you this is so different than what the other surrounding religions are teaching this is what God is actually like, and this is what humans are actually like. That's what Moses is doing in Genesis 1 when he writes Genesis 1. This is actually what creation is like. In context of all these other religions, remember they're surrounded by, with Moses, right? They're surrounded by Egypt, Egypt's pantheon of gods, the, 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 the plagues in um, the book of Exodus. Each plague is a representative of a god that's being judged in Egypt, and each one of those gods it typically is horribly abusive to the people. So it's not like Egypt had this um, beauty, beautiful view of what their, their, their gods were. Um, 
e- Egypt, Egypt's being judged by the locusts and the and and the um, you know the frogs and all these. These are all pictures of Egyptian gods, and they're all being judged. And and then the death of the firstborn is a judgment against those kind of practices in ancient Egypt. So it it specifically says the gods of Egypt are being judged in Exodus. There's a particular passage there. Um, so anyway, so Moses is writing to the Israelites in the context of ancient pagan myths and saying, this is what God is like, this is what creation is like, and this is what human beings are like, and they're all good, and they're all ordered, and they're all lovely, and they all have a purpose. And so this tells us something about what it means to be human right off the bat when we look at um, we look at Genesis 1. What it means to be human, it means to be, what it means to be human is to be participants in God's good creation. The other thing that wouldn't have been lost on an early reader, it, and, and, and if we investigate this, we can see how that's the case, is that Moses is using temple creating language here. When he talks about the creation of the um, of the um, of uh, when he talks about creation, the whole creation narrative, and and we see that especially when um, it says the uh, let's see where let there God says uh, verse six God said let there be an expanse or a firmament as some translations would say let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters let it, let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse, verse 7, and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and so it was so. And he called the expanse heaven, and there was an evening, there was a morning, and a second day. So what he, what he, this is creation, this is temple language. He is, it's actually um, mirroring the temple creating narrative in Exodus. And he's got the outer court, he has the... Um, holy place and he has the holy of holies and so we have here in creation we have we have an expanse above we have an expanse here we have an expanse below and actually in exodus or in ezekiel um the last couple chapters in ezekiel when ezekiel's shown a vision of the temple and he's shown a vision of the future israel we see the same kind of distinction being made the expanse above the middle waters and the expanse beneath and so we've got three stages there and, and so this is this is not just a a story about creation it's a story about temples and when you look at what is being said here see in an in an ancient temple you would create the temple and then you would always place the think about this right think about the um, the Philistines and the temples that the Philistines had okay and if you remember this and I'm I can't I'm just pulling this off the cuff right now. Um, so I don't remember what the actual passage is, but in the history of Israel, they're going against the Philistines, and the god of the Philistines, Dagon, is um, is knocked over when the Philistines bring the ark into Dagon's temple, and because in a temple you put the image of the temple, which is the god Dagon, and it was a, a you know, it's hypothetically what what the seems like the narrative tells us is that Dagon was a half fish, half human god, um, and Dagon is knocked down multiple times over. They try and bring him back up uh, and when the when the ark is there, and they eventually they send the ark back to Israel because. But but the idea is that, and it's right it's right within the assum- the assumed narrative, but we gloss right over it is they had a temple, and in their temple they placed the image of their god. Because the image of the God always told you what the temple was like that that temple was um, uh, was pointed towards. And so we have in Genesis 1, we have temple language. So you've got God creating the temple, God creating creation as a temple. And you see the, the same kind of language that exists about the, the three different spaces within the temple. You've got the three different spaces within creation. And so you're looking at temple building language. And then you have the image being placed within the temple. This is right at the end of Genesis 1, where it says, um, verse uh, 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So the God puts an image of himself in the temple and says, like, it, like if you think about this, right? Okay, so um, God creates the 
uh, the the um, fish of the sea and the animals on the ground. And then it says every one of them um, propagates after their own kind. And so uh, basically they have babies. And uh, and so he he takes he takes what's formless and void and brings structure and beauty to it. And then he propagates life on it. And then he creates human beings. And he said, now go be fruitful and multiply, right? And um, that's verse 28. And, and bring to bear over creation, rule over the fish of the sea, rule over the birds of the sky, rule over the animals on the ground. So basically what God is saying is what you, what I've just done, bringing structure and bringing order and propagating, um, propagating life on earth. Now you're responsible for that. So he places, he creates a temple, places his image in the temple and then says, now look like me. Okay. And then he, he goes, then he looks over his creation, which is God's temple and says, it's very good because his image is in it. And so this has now brought the status of humanity to incredible heights, basically. Okay. So humanity is not equal to the birds of the air, the fish of the sea and the animals on the ground. Humanity is not equal to the creation itself. Humanity is actually the very image of God placed within his temple to show what he's like through his temple. That's the story that we have here in Genesis uh, in Genesis 1, juxtaposed with contemporary worldview that says humankind's an infestation, or an ancient worldview which says humankind's an afterthought of the gods and not even important, we have actually human beings are the direct result of the thought of God. And this is a very patristic thought. Um, I've got a quote here from uh, Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory of Nyssa was a fourth century theologian. He said this, he thought and things came to be. Informed, the divine thought is the complicated womb of all that is. So he thought and creation happened. He thought and you happened. So creation is not the, the result of a chaotic process of God's duking it out, which is what most other creation stories in the ancient world are all about. Like if you look at the, the, um, the Zoroastrian Babylonian religion, it's the God, Mar it's, what is it, Marduk or, or um, there's, there's two gods, the God of light and the God of darkness, and they're constantly at war with each other. Uh, or you've got um, Zeus and then the, um, uh, the gods, the, the, the more powerful gods is Zeus. I can't remember the name of them, but there's gods that lived beneath that were the, the chaotic gods that formed everything. And so you've got all these stories about this chaos that ruled creation. But here you've got the story of the, the, the wonderful, loving, thoughtful God who looked at his creation and said, it's very good. And the patristics pick that up. They don't look at Genesis one and go, um, Gregory of Parksville thinks sometimes too. Yeah. 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 Uh, they don't look at creation and, and the creation narrative and go, well, what does this teach us about the scientific method? They look at it and go, what does this teach us about God and man, who we are and what our role is on the earth? And so, like I said, Gregory of Nyssa goes, he thought and things come into being. Creation is an avenue of demonstrating the thought of God, what he thinks about, what he's like. And that's a beautiful thing that brings creation up to here, that brings humanity up to here, that we're called as a, vocationally to bear the image of God into this world and to bring about his nature and his likeness into this world. Now we know, because you know, we're not going to jump too far ahead, but Genesis 3, humankind kind of, they, we, we kind of muck the whole thing up, you know, and we'll talk about that. But, um, but in Genesis 1, suffice it to say that God has established humanity's beauty and humanity's vocation and humanity's calling and creation's beauty, creation's vocation, and creation's calling. Creation is to be a temple that houses the presence of the living God and mankind is to look like that living God everywhere they go. And that's what we see, actually, what we see Adam doing. Now, what's interesting is um, you can see this, shades of this throughout the, uh, throughout the, um, uh, well, throughout the Old Testament, anyway. Uh, when it says in Genesis 1-2, now we're getting into some pretty heady waters, I think. We'll see. Genesis 1-2, it says, the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the earth. Okay, that term moving is actually really important. 
Um, and and it, 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 I think if I remember right, it's it's related to the Hebrew word tohu, which means to be a whirlwind over. And so when we see the spirit hovering over creation, that we the next time we see that particular word used in its application in the Old Testament is in Deuteronomy thirty two eleven. So if you want to turn with me to De- Deuteronomy thirty two eleven, so this is going to give us some kind of idea of what all this is to look like. This is Deuteronomy 32 is Moses singing about God leading Israel through the wilderness. And in verse 11, he says this, like an eagle that stirs up its nest that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them and he carried them on his pinions. Um, This is, I'm reading out of the NASB. So whatever you guys are, if you're following along with me. Um, So basically that word, um, that word uh, uh, to hover over, the spirit hovered over creation, right? What Moses says, because Moses wrote Deuteronomy, wrote, he wrote Genesis. So this is intentional. So Moses goes, the spirit hovered over creation and brought form out of chaos. That same spirit is God who hovered over us. The eagle that hovered over its nest is the direct comparison to God hovering over the Israelites. Well, how did God hover over the Israelites? He did it in the temple. He did it over the temple. Fire by day, uh, or or cloud by day, fire by night. Hovering over the temple, leading and guiding them, bringing them out of the chaos of Egypt and into his promised land, placing them in his space and giving them the the structure for a temple and then giving them the image to bear. So we see the same kind of language playing out, and actually the same kind of language we can find again in um, in Ezekiel when you see the whirlwind coming, and which which if you if you look at Ezekiel one, the whirlwind comes like we'll just turn there real quick. Turn with me to Ezekiel one because you'll see similar language. It's crazy the kind of layers that this that is uh, that are it's in the text. Um, Ezekiel one. Ezekiel has this incredible picture, and uh, he says, um, "I looked, and behold, storm was a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with flashing, with fire flashing forth continually, and bright light around it, and in, in its midst something like a glowing metal in the midst of the fire." So Ezekiel, what Ezekiel describes is the exact same thing the Israelites describe. We saw a cloud and fire within the cloud, and at night we could see the fire a lot more distinctly because it was dark out. And it's even the same thing. When the Israelites leave Egypt and the Egyptian army pursues them, we saw a cloud stood between the army and us, and in the midst of the cloud was a fire, a light. And so Ezekiel, when he says that, he's bringing all the way back. He's pulling on this narrative in the the first five books of the Bible and saying, that whole thing, that's what I saw. So he's, he's, I think Ezekiel's consciously doing this. What I saw there was like all that stuff that happened back then. I saw the the cloud come to me, right? I saw the fire within the cloud. And anybody, any Israelite who read that would have gone, oh, well, that's like God in the wilderness. That's like um, what happened to the Israelites. That's like the spirit hovering over the face of the deep. So we've got this parallels all the way throughout the Old Testament that talk about what God is like. Now here... In Ezekiel, we start to peer into the cloud, right? He's drawn in, Ezekiel's taken into the cloud and he sees the very throne of God, the very being of God and the activity of God in the cloud. So what we see in Genesis 1, the activity of God is hovering over creation, bringing creation to bear so that it would look like him and that it would reflect his glory. Then we see the spirit hovering over Israel and leading them, you know, same language, why bringing creation to bear, what does he look like and how is he going to be known? And then we see in Ezekiel through the prophetic books, we see the, the spirit of God. We see the nature of God hovering over creation and bringing form uh, and, uh, and um, bringing his image and likeness to bear on his people. So we're seeing this all throughout scripture, not just in Genesis 1, the same. And, and in fact, actually, you know, maybe this is something that will intrigue you. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 tell the whole story of the Bible. The whole story. 
of the Bible, the whole story of the Old Testament, I should say. They tell the whole, because there's not the redemptive arc of it. They tell the whole story of the Old Testament. They show God choosing people, giving them his likeness, giving them a vocation, and them messing it up. It keeps happening. It's like, it's like the rest of the Old Testament is just Genesis 1, 2, and 3 continuing to play out. The same story over and over and over again. God choosing people, setting them aside, giving them his image and likeness, giving them a vocation to model, to mirror to the people what he's like, and them messing it all up. And then them being taken out of the place that they've been given. So you just see the same thing happening over and over again. So when we look at Genesis 1, we see what's the reason God does this that his image and his likeness would be in creation. Now, the early church fathers, they, they would say something like this regarding the image and likeness um, uh, uh, thread right there. They would say uh, something to the effect like this. I can't, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but you can, you can, um, you can, well, you can take it with a grain of salt. You can look it up yourself, but they would say, we are his image by nature. We are his likeness by grace. And so he he creates us in his image so that we look like him, but we become like him. We are, we we are made in his image, and we they would say maybe we are made in his image. We acquire his likeness. So he's in the business of forming humanity. Now here's one of the things that we have to recognize. This is the last thing that I want to say. Um, I think for this live stream, uh, we'll see because I've got lots to say about the Genesis one, two, and three thing. Um, it's another really interesting one. Um, when you look at the state of humanity, um, like, like the, the hypothetically, okay, God creates the garden. God creates the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God creates the tree of life, but he created everything. Um, and, and then he tells the uh, Adam and Eve, of the tree, you can eat every tree in the garden, right? He doesn't say just the tree of life. Every tree in the garden you can eat of, all but this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, he says that one you can't eat of. And the question that the early fathers wrestled with, and and I think had a, some good insight on, is does this mean that they were never to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or does this mean that they weren't ready to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And that's a good question because if if God created all of this, said it was good, and we don't have any kind of infiltration where it says that the devil came and created another tree and said, um, you know, he God doesn't say, well, that tree that the devil made, don't eat of that. So it's the tree that he made, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know it's a tree he made because he also says that if they eat it, they become like us. So this means it's a reflection of him, of his deity, right? It's a reflection of who he is because the tree, the fruit of the tree would make them like him. So it's a reflection of him. So he makes a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and says, don't eat of it. Does that mean that they were never to eat of it? Or does that mean that they were to eat of it when they were ready to eat of it? And that what they had to do was go through a process of formation and transformation so that they knew him and became like him before they were ready to bear the image into the world in the way that he intended. So the early church fathers would say that's the case, that humanity was too immature to bear the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that is proven by the Old Testament, but it's proven by ancient history and how just how chaotically evil humanity actually is in the ancient world. Now, today... Uh, in North America, largely you can walk down the road or drive down the road and not be concerned that someone is going to jump out of the um, uh, jump out of the side and shoot you down and gun you down and take all your money. Now that can still happen because we do have a propensity propensity to evil. Um, but in the ancient world, that was a common day, everyday, common everyday occurrence. This this mean we we've made leaps and bounds, strides like. You wouldn't believe when it comes to the moral code in society. I like to say that, uh, uh, you know, the 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 Old Testament, the Ten Commandments aren't, uh, these aren't like advanced moral living because most people in modern age could sneeze and fulfill 80% of the Ten Commandments. And without even thinking, you could fulfill 80% of the Ten Commandments. This is the bare minimum for society to get by is the Ten Commandments. 
So it's not like God's dealing with a maturely developed moral sense in people. These people mucked everything up and they continue to mess everything up. And he's going, okay, I need to give them by degrees things that they can handle. And, and so we don't see the picture of a, a, uh, a mature, integrated, loving human in Genesis 1 and 2. The very first thing they do is mess everything up. But we do see an image bearer in Genesis 1 and 2. And how do we know that? Because, one, we see Adam being given responsibility to, one, to name the animals, right? And he names all the animals, so we see that there's great wisdom, right? There's great power in that. We see him prophesying the destiny of Eve. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. When the, you know, the, uh, the wife will leave mother and father and come and cleave with her husband. Right, we see him prophesying, so we have to see the function of prophecy. We're right within Adam, we're, and actually, you could probably make a case in Adam the fact that he named the animals. You probably have some kind of language speaking to communicate with the animals. Uh, you would seem to be. We see shades of that right with uh, the the donkey speaking to Balaam in the Old Testament. So we see shades of that uh, in in throughout the Old Testament too. Um, uh, and, you know, stories like Francis of Assisi preaching to the birds of the air and them pausing to listen or him talking to the wolf and these kind of things. We see, you know, maybe they're legends or mythos. It's hard to say, but uh, great to see you, Matthew. Um, so we, we see Adam in his vocation uh, doing the kind of things that you could only expect God to do on some level and being led into it through degrees, you know, Adam's lacking, and so we need to give him a partner. We need to give him a calling. We need to give him um, a vocation. We need to give him. So there's a there's a progression that Adam's being led to uh, through this. Uh, but here's here's the last thing I wanted to say that I hadn't said already is in Genesis one, when God makes mankind, there's a particular word used in verse. I think it's in verse twenty six when it says, "Let us make man in our image." And if, um, if you were to do a word study on the term make, now it's used a couple other times in the context of Genesis 1, but it's specifically used with, it's not let us create man in our image. It's a different word. Let us make man in our image. The word for make is, you could just look in the Strong's for this. This is both in the Greek and in the Hebrew, uh, but I think it's the emphasis is even stronger in the Greek. Let us make man in our image. And, and the term itself, it, 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 you know, look in Strong's, look in the Complete Word Study Dictionary, whatever you want. The term itself means to initiate a project. Let us make a project and we'll make man our project. So God, in his creation of humanity, initiates a project. Now, a project is something you work on over time, right? It's not something, man, this is the thing. Mankind in Genesis 1, implied in the text, isn't finished. Mankind is incomplete in Genesis 1. And we know that because he hasn't he doesn't have access to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he doesn't he doesn't have access to everything, every every capacity under the sun. So mankind is the project that God initiates to take on his image and likeness and propagate it throughout all of creation. So God initiates a project in Adam, and this is why he's called the first Adam in Scripture. The project of what it looks like to be human doesn't find its fulfillment in Adam. So the whole goal of the, uh, of the um, Old Testament narrative is not— or My son just walked in. I'm doing a live stream right now, Finn— um, the whole goal of the New Testament narrative or, or the Old Testament narrative is not to say, or the New Testament redemptive narrative is not to say that we need to get back to what it was like in Genesis, because in Genesis, mankind wasn't complete. The whole goal of the redemptive narrative in the New Testament is to look forward to what humanity looks like in Jesus. Adam is the first Adam, First uh, Corinthians 15, uh, 45 and the next few verses lays this out. We have the first Adam, 
and we have the last Adam. So when Jesus says on the cross, it is finished, this is the language that the early authors looked at that said the 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 in, the project of humankind is now made complete. It is finished. Jesus is the perfect picture of what it looks like to be a human being. So that's what we want to look at as we're going forward is what does it look like to be a, uh, a, a, a what does it look like to actually be a spiritual being and a human being? We can look at Adam and we can get ideas. Finley's having fun back there. We're just wrapping up. We can look at Adam and Eve and we can get some ideas. We can look in creation. We can see the nature of God. He's good. We can see the nature of creation. It's good. We can see Adam and Eve. They're good. But what it looks like to be human, Adam and Eve point us forward to the it is finished statement that what it looks like to be human is what we find in Jesus. And so we're going to talk about that on our next stream. We will go live next week. And um, we're trying to figure out time that works every week. But I hope that this was informative to you, that when we look at the uh, the narrative of creation, that in the narrative of creation, we see certain elements that teach us about God, that teach us about the Father, that teach us about creation, and that this counteracts what we see today and what we've seen throughout history, that humankind um, tends to be a plague upon the earth. We don't. We have a grand vocation and a ground call, and that's to look like him, and we see that fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So we'll go live again. Um, there's a few links that you can find uh, in the video description. Um we have resources that would that are intended to help you grow, courses, books, all those things. You can find links there. We have a spiritual mentorship program and an inner healing program. You can find all that stuff linked on our website. If you'd like to support Wind Ministries, there's a link to donate in the video description. We'd appreciate your support as well. Uh, but our heart and our goal is to work through some of these uh, some of these concepts that seem to be confusing and bring bring some uh, clarity to that. Humankind has a grand vocation to look like the Father, and creation is good. And so thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And until next week, Finley, go ahead and say goodbye. Bye, boy. Oh. <laughs> That's my son. <laughs>